Mark chapter 7, God's word reads, starting in verse 31. Then he, Jesus, returned from the region of Tyre and went throughout or through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, touched his tongue, and looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be open. And his ears were open, and his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And God charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute this is God's word. Amen? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. When my wife and I were dating, uh, towards the beginning of our, or towards the end of our dating relationship, uh, she drove nonstop all the way from Jonesboro, Arkansas to Santa Clarita, California. 1,762 miles non-stop. And this is going to sound really egotistical, but I still think it's cool. What was the reason why she did that? She, that's right. Cool. That, did I, have I told this to you guys before? Okay. Crew. I was a little worried about that before this, but she did it. She's like, oh, she, used, she thought of me. She's like, the guy can do nothing wrong. I'm going to go be with him. We dated. (laughs) We dated. She thinks I can do nothing wrong. I'm just a superhero on a pedestal. And then we got married. (laughs) And you all know what happens after that. I went from this shining superhero to this somewhat lovable project. (laughs) in about six months flat. Why? Because as Kimberly and I grew closer and closer together, the more apparent my sinfulness, the more apparent my selfishness became. And this is true of anyone as we draw closer and closer to them. Whether we're rich or poor, old or young, educated, uneducated, people are people. And we can place them up on a pedestal from a distance, but as we go closer to them and closer to them, we realize that they're flawed. They're flawed just like us. And this is true of everyone that lives on the globe right now and everyone that has been on the globe except one person. Who is that person? Jesus Christ is perfect. And the closer and closer we draw to Jesus, the more and more we begin to realize just how graciously perfect He really is. As one of my favorite hymns says, the longer I serve Him, the sweeter He grows. The more that I love Him, the more love He bestows. Each day is like heaven, my heart overflows. The longer I serve Him, the sweeter He grows. Jesus has never sinned and never will sin. Jesus has never broken a promise and he never will. He's the one on the pedestal that will never fall down and never has. The closer and closer that we draw to Jesus, the brighter and brighter his gracious perfection glows. What are we going to see in Mark chapter 7? We're going to dive into the ministry of Jesus Christ. We're going to get up close and personal, and we're going to see this truth. But the closer and closer we get to knowing who Jesus is and what he is and what he's done, the brighter his perfection glows. And I hope your heart today just overflows with encouragement as a result of looking at the life and ministry of Jesus. Let's do this, that. Look at Mark chapter 7, starting in verse 31. 
Mark chapter 7, verse 31 says, Then he, that's Jesus, returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. Two weeks ago, you'll remember that we were in this region right here in Israel, the region of Tyre, where Jesus met a Syrophoenician woman. And this Syrophoenician woman had a problem, a desperate need. Her daughter was demon-possessed. She came to Jesus, and Jesus, in his gracious perfection, did what? He healed her as no one else could. And then from there, we come to verse 31, and we see Jesus make this roundabout path to the region of the Decapolis. And it's important to remember what happened the last time Jesus was in this region. Do you guys remember what happened the last time Jesus was in the Decapolis? Anybody? <laughs> Mark chapter 5. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 5. Let's see what Jesus did in this region prior because it affects the passage today. Mark chapter 5, starting in verse 1, it reads, They, that's Jesus and the disciples, came to the other side of the sea, to the country of Gerasenes, which is in the Decapolis, which is in the same region that we're in in Mark chapter 7 today. And the passage continues. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one can bind him any more, not even with chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and the mountains, he was crying out and cutting himself with stones. The last time Jesus was in this region, he ran into this individual. And in his gracious perfection, what did he do? He reached out to him and healed him as no one else could. And then what did Jesus tell this man, this former demoniac, to do? Go ahead and look at verse 19 of Mark chapter 5. Verse 19 of Mark chapter 5, Jesus tells the man, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And what does the man do? We continue in verse 20. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him and everyone marveled. So in Mark chapter 5, before we come to Mark chapter 7, we have this man who's just spreading the news of Jesus Christ like wildfire. And everyone is marveling over who has healed this man. So when we turn back to Mark chapter 7, what's it look like? If you hold Mark chapter 7 by itself, it can appear like it's just some quiet, docile moment where just Jesus, his disciples, and this man that needs healing, and maybe a few friends. But that's actually nothing what it's like. As a result of that man's witness throughout this entire region, this place is just absolutely exploding with joy around Jesus. It doesn't communicate that in Mark chapter 7, but it does in Matthew's account in Mark, Matthew chapter 15. Same account, Jesus went from there, speaking of Tyre, and walked beside the Sea of Galilee on the eastern side, where we saw on the map, and he went up on the mountain and sat down there, and, they, and great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put them at his feet, and he healed them so that the crowd wondered. When they saw the mute speaking, the cripple healthy, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. This scene is absolute, absolutely joyful pandemonium. Mark gives us this big picture. These people are bringing the sick, they're bringing the lame, they're bringing the blind, they're bringing the mute, and they're laying them out Jesus' his feet. This phrase right here, put them in the Greek, is literally to throw or to cast down with haste. The picture is massive crowds swarming towards Jesus and sort of just like throwing the sick to him and like this big massive pile where he's reaching out and he's healing everyone. And there's this joyful pandemonium joyful pandemonium, and people are glorifying the God of Israel. Matthew gives us that big picture of this same account that we see in Mark chapter 7. Mark zooms in to one specific event within that larger event. 
Matthew gives us the joyful pandemonium. Mark, here in Mark chapter 7, zooms in to one aspect and gives us, allows us to see that personal, loving, gracious touch of Jesus. Let's go ahead and look at it. Mark chapter 7, starting in verse 32. We've zoomed in from this joyful pandemonium. Verse 32, And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. Now that Greek word that you see there for speech impediment is the word magalalos. And it's a very rare word. In fact, it's only used twice in the entire Bible. It's a very poignant word. It doesn't mean just a slight stammer. It means extreme difficulty. Essentially, this man was deaf, and people had trouble communicating to him. And he had such this, this speech impediment that was so restricting that he, it was almost impossible for him to communicate to others using his mouth. And there's no hearing aids in this time. There is no speech coaches. He is ostracized. He is alone, essentially. The people of this day, including Israel, would see anyone with this speech impediment or this hearing loss as someone that is mentally deficient, someone that is mentally handicapped, that they have a screw loose up here so they're having trouble communicating on the outside. They would view them as mentally deficient, and they would also view them as spiritually deficient. Why? Because they would see this man's problem and say, you must be cursed by God. So this man is ostracized. This man is absolutely miserable. And look what they asked Jesus to do at the end of verse 32. And they begged him to lay his hand on him. No self-respecting rabbi, no self-respecting religious leader of this day would ever consider such a thing. The religious leadership of the day would have seen this man as ceremonially unclean and to be avoided. Just like the priest and the Levite in the story of the Good Samaritan, they would have crossed to the other side of the road and say, stay away from me. But Jesus isn't like those proud and those callous religious leaders. No, he has a habit of reaching out to those who are in need. In Mark chapter 1, when Peter's mother-in-law is sick, what does he do? He reaches out, tenderly take her, takes her by the hand, and heals her. Mark chapter 1, when the leper comes to him, what does he do? He doesn't run away like everyone else, but he reaches out in his tender, perfect compassion and heals him. In Mark chapter 5, a woman comes to him with a 12-year-old hemorrhage that's destroying her life. A girl is dead. He heals the woman. He raises the girl from the dead. How? With his tender, compassionate, perfect touch. He reaches out. He's nothing like the religious elite. And look what he does in verse 33. It says, And taking him aside from the crowd privately, amidst all the commotion." amidst all the joyful pandemonium, amidst all the people waiting to be healed, amidst all the people waiting for their loved ones to be healed, Jesus takes this man who has been discounted and essentially probably avoided all of his life and gives him his full attention. For as long as this man has had this infirmity, he has been scorned, ostracized, despised, alone. But in this moment, he considers, the, he receives, excuse me, he receives the full consideration and the kindness of God himself. That is our Savior. That is our mighty God. Look again at verse 33. It says, And he put his fingers into his ears, and after spitting, touched his tongue, and looking up to heaven, he sighed, and said, Ephatha, that is, be opened. I have a question. Why does Jesus do that? Why does he put his finger in his ears? Why does he spit on his hand and touch his mouth? Why does he look up to heaven? Why does he sigh or groan before he calls out and says, be opened, Ephatha? Why does he do all of that? 
I think this Jesus does all of this. I think he's communicating non-verbally to this man exactly that he knows exactly what his problem really is. Jesus is saying, I know what your problem is. The rest of society would have marked him off, disregarded him as mentally handicapped, mentally deficient, or spiritually deficient. But Jesus says, no, I know. Let me communicate to you exactly what your problem really is. That I understand where you are coming from. That I understand where you're at. Let me touch your ears to signify that I know that you are deaf. And it's not because you're illiterate or dumb that people are communicating to you and you don't understand most of the time. Let me touch your mouth to communicate that no, it's not just mentally defi- you're not mentally deficient and that's why you have a problem getting it out, but your tongue is tied. You have an impediment. Why does he spit on his hand? Well, saliva in this day and age was seen to have healing powers. Does it? No. But Jesus uses it as a symbol, spits it on his hand, and says, I am going to heal you. Why does he look on, up to heaven? Because he wants this man to know it's a God thing. It's a generic gesture everyone understands. Why does he sigh? Why does his shoulder lower? Why does he groan? Because he wants to communicate to this man that I care for you. Your need being addressed is a deep desire for me. This man, one person says, excuse me, I'm going to say it this differently. One person writes this. Just imagine being this individual. You've been un- misunderstood, misjudged, and mistreated for years, if not a lifetime. And all of a sudden, Jesus, the man everyone is clamoring for, gives you his full attention, pulls you aside, and clearly communicates in a way that you understand, you understand, and says to you, I understand, I know, I care, and I am going to do something about it. Jesus is exercising his gracious, perfect care for this person. We get from a distance, it's joyful pandemonium around Jesus, and up close, it's joy around Jesus. He is our perfect Savior. And this compassion that's just emanating from Jesus doesn't only come from here. You roll down to chapter 8, verse 2, and what does it say? It says that Jesus looks out on the crowd and he has what for them? He has compassion for them. And he feeds them all. Mark chapter 5, he sees the crowd of 5,000 men, not including women and children, probably 25,000 people. The text says he's moved with compassion. Absolutely all the time. You go to Matthew 9, Matthew 14, Matthew 18, 20, 21, the perfect heart of Jesus, or the heart of Jesus is on display. And it's always what? It's full of perfect compassion perfect love because we have a perfect amazing Savior. From that we come to verse 33 again. Look at verse 33 again. And he puts, and he put his finger into his ears and after spitting touched his tongue and looking up to heaven he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is be opened and his ears were opened his tongue released and he spoke plainly. That phrase for his tongue was released is literally the chain of his tongue was broken. He goes from not being able to hear, not being able to speak, to being able to hear perfectly, being able to speak plainly so everyone can understand him. Just as Jesus breaks the chain of our sin that holds us back from a right relationship with God, Jesus breaks the chains that are holding this man back from communicating from others. Now look at verse 36. And Jesus charged them to tell no one. But the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And it's right here where I'm like, I see gracious perfection flow through, and then right here I'm like, I'm not sure if he's so perfect. 
Why in the world would he do that? This man has been unable to communicate essentially and receive communication for years, if not a lifetime. And once Jesus gives it to him, says, now you can speak, now you can hear, he says, don't speak. Don't utilize the ability that I've just given you. Why in the world would he do that? We have to remember the overall context that we saw in Matthew. Matthew chapter 15. What's the overall picture when you step back? It's joyful pandemonium. It's, Jesus, it's people coming to Jesus. Why? Not necessarily to hear the good news of the kingdom of God, but to receive healing. Are healings bad? No. Does Jesus hate giving healings? No. He loves to heal people as we see in this passage and in Matthew chapter 15. But that's not the primary objective. He has a better, a more loving objective. And that better, more loving objective than them receiving physical, temporal healing is them hearing the word of God, the kingdom of God, hearing of the kingdom of God that can change their life and establish an everlasting, restored relationship with God. So Jesus has a priority. He loves to heal. But healing comes second. Physical healing comes second to spiritual healing. So he encourages this man and the people around him not to tell anyone. To stop the frenzy over the healing so we can highlight the main, the ultimate message. And from there we come to verse 37. They didn't do a God, good job listening to Jesus. They didn't understand, which is understandable. They communicate it, and look at what they say in verse 37. It says, and they were astonished beyond measure, literally struck with amazement, saying, he has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. They're blown out of their minds by the wonder and work of Jesus Christ. And they say of Jesus, he has done all things well. Well, That word well there is the Greek word kalos, which means rightly, correctly, appropriately. They've heard of Jesus and everything that he was able to do, and now they've seen Jesus for their own eyes, and he's everything that they could have imagined and more. He indeed is the gracious, perfect Savior that they need. The closer they got to Jesus, the more his gracious perfection rings. And before I close, I want to talk about the last statement in this passage. When these people say, he even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. And to address this, let's turn to Isaiah chapter 35. And we'll close here. In Isaiah chapter 34, there's death, destruction, it's tribulation. It's future tribulation that is coming upon Israel and coming upon this earth. Then chapter 35 is what? Is Jesus coming back and it's establishing his millennial kingdom, his thousand year reign on earth. And what does he describe it? How does he describe this thousand year reign? It says in Isaiah chapter 35 verse 1, the wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like a crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. There's going to be a change in the landscape as a result of Jesus coming and blessing it. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make, the firm, make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are anxious of heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance and, re and with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. The eyes of the blind shall be open and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute shall sing for joy. When Jesus comes back in his millennial rule after the tribulation, What's it going to look like? It's going to look like this. And in Mark chapter 7, we saw Jesus' gracious perfection. We saw a taste of this. 
I want to drive this home. What we see in Mark chapter 7 is one instance, is a taste of the gracious perfection of Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 35 tells us there's more coming. That as we draw closer and closer to God, and He comes closer and closer to us, the brighter His gracious perfection will glow. We see something great, something phenomenal and encouraging in Mark chapter 7. But Isaiah chapter 35 says we haven't seen anything yet. When he comes back, and we draw closer to him if we're there, then the brighter and brighter his perfection will glow. I hope you are encouraged by Mark chapter 7 and drawing closer to Jesus by looking at his life. I hope you're so encouraged by that. I think, and I hope if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, that you're compelled to become a believer in Jesus Christ that you want Jesus Christ in your life, someone that is graciously perfect for you. God is good. Amen? Amen. He is graciously perfect. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. God, we adore you. God, we praise you. God, we magnify you. You are holy, you are majestic, you're perfect. Your Son displays that perfection, and we look forward to clearer vision, seeing it all the more as we draw closer to you, as you come, and as we dwell with you. So God, you are good, you are willing, you are able, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.